I want to go ahead, the word flaky. Okay, y'all saw the hashtag for the video. The word flaky, I looked up the definition. The word flaky means <clears throat> to break or easily separate into small pieces. So when something is not solid, it's flaky. When people are flaky, it means they don't function well. Forgetfulness, um, losing things, not living up to your commitments are common characteristics of people who struggle with flakiness. Flakiness can cause a person to engage in high-risk behavior, such as driving way too fast because you're always running behind trying to play catch-up. I know you're thinking of somebody right now if that's not you. Binge drinking, binge eating, binge spending, habitual bad decision-making is a product and a struggle of anyone who struggles with flakiness. And I know, I know what you're thinking, a lot of you, and I get it. Your life is not your your life isn't flaky. That's not what I want to talk about, but that's not what I want to talk about because your faith is. Every one of our faith is flaky. Oh, we all got flaky faith. Which is why I want to talk about faith that's not flaky today. I want to talk about faith that's not flaky, and I want you to, when we go live at 11, just as Sarah D. said, this is a message that makes us catalyst. I want you to share this video, hashtag when you share it, flaky faith, because what I want to do is I want to help you build a solid faith with your life so that we don't walk out of here and keep struggling and stressing so much because it's happening. And it's happening for reasons that a lot of people don't preach about or talk about. There's some parts of your faith that you don't realize are flaky. There's some parts of your faith that are very dysfunctional. You don't realize it. You've been in church for years. You know the Bible real well, but you don't realize there's some parts of your faith that are dysfunctional. And I'm going to go ahead and put this out there right now before we even jump into it. This message is not for your sister. This message is not for your spouse. This message is not for your boyfriend or girlfriend. This message is not for your supervisor. This message is not for your mom and daddy. This message is not for the other political party that you do not belong to. This message is for me. I'm preaching to me and I'm preaching to you. And I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this out there from the beginning. If you, Your life will never change until you change. You will never have lasting change until you're willing to look in the mirror and change yourself. But we're all on default mode. We're talking about everybody else. And I'm just going to put this out there. If you're the type of person that when I preach this message, you're thinking about everybody else that needs to hear it, you're either going to be pissed off or you're going to get nothing out of it. For all my people that you want to grow, and you know that growth doesn't just start with you, it centers around you. If I got some people that want to grow today, I promise you if you will open your heart and look in the mirror, God's got something for you. But you got to want it. You got to want it. So for my people that are, that are okay with being offended if it leads to growth, here we go. My point today about faith. Faith isn't just what you believe. It's how you practice it. Oh, I'm telling you, we all like to talk about what we believe. We all like to post about what we believe, who we believe in, and what it looks like. We love it. But faith isn't just what you believe. It's how you practice what you believe. You only got half of it when you want to believe right. It's not just what you believe, it's how you believe it. It's how you practice it. We can, you can say the right things. I mean, you can quote, quote all the verses. You may can outquote KJV, outquote me and KJV because I stopped memorizing that stuff a long time ago. You can go to church every Sunday. You can know how to play this church part and you built your entire opinions around what preachers say you can do all. I'm telling you, you can do it like they say to do it right. My question to you is this. Has Jesus, has Jesus affected your heart? I didn't say has he changed some habits in your life. I didn't say you've, you've learned some good habits. I said has your heart changed? Has your heart changed? Because, see, you may have quit drinking, but you're just as angry as before, except now you can't use alcohol as an excuse for your anger. You changed some habits, but your heart didn't change. And, and I want to ask you, listen, there's a lot of people who have faith in Jesus, but Jesus has not affected their heart the way he wants to. 
I'm included. I just want to be open. So I'm going to ask you some questions. You hear me? You love me, Catalyst? Because I'm not afraid anymore. Like this season, I've been afraid enough. We're taking steps. I'm not apologizing for being and saying what God called me to be and say. I'm open to being wrong, but I'm not apologizing for what I feel is right. Be honest with these questions because real change never happens until you're willing to challenge yourself in ways that you don't want to be challenged. Because challenge isn't comfortable. Challenge isn't comfortable and growth doesn't come without being uncomfortable. So here we go. Here's a, here's a question. And you may like in the media be offended by it, but you really got to look deeper. Do you feel like those that don't believe like you are beneath you? First question. Do you feel like you're better than those who don't behave like you? Here's a good one. How about those who won't be voting like you? How about the people who will passionately vote for the other person? If you're, not, if, you're, if you're really struggling to answer these questions or you don't want to answer them, I'll give you a good idea. Go look at your social media history for the last year. Go look at it. Because if a majority or honestly much of any of your posts are critical, and I'm not talking about just ugly, I mean critical, then that's the answer to your question. It is not solid faith, y'all. To look in, to have this idea of all oh, this young generation that wears their pants on the ground, they don't have to work for anything, and they think they know everything. That is not solid faith. It's not, and I'm gonna prove it to you. Young people, it is not solid faith to have the hole that's out there, listen here, boomer mentality. That is not solid faith. I have learned life-changing lessons from leaders that I agree with almost nothing on with them. And some seasons I agree on even less than nothing. I have been able to grow and get good things from people that have treated me badly. And I'm not talking about in the next season. I'm talking about in the seasons they treated me badly. Solid faith. Solid faith, and I'm going to show you, is when what you say you believe becomes your common practice. I'm talking about when good preaching becomes good practice. We would not even know who Jesus was today if he just preached the greatest message of all time. But he didn't just preach it. The other side of his faith, he practiced it. He practiced it. So I want to I wanna jump into the book of James. James chapter 2. Before I do, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. I'm going to challenge. I, wanna, I got a challenge for everybody. Because I know this season is so stressful, and every season is the same as far as this goes. I'm going to ask, do you want to grow, Catalyst? Do you want to get better? And by get better, I mean be a better human being. Do you want it? Yeah. Well, if you want it, here's the deal. It does not just happen on this platform on Sunday mornings. This is the start of the conversation. But if it ends here, you will never find the growth that God has for you. And you will never experience the promises that he has for you. Ever. So I'm going to start this out there. I'm going to throw a challenge out there. James chapter 2. I'm only going to be able to read a little bit of it. I'm only going to be able to talk about a little bit of it. Tonight, I didn't say this week. If you want to grow tonight, today, when you go home, who you go home with, who you go to bed next to, put your kids to bed and, and read this chapter. James chapter 2, write it down together. We got it on the app, the sermon notes, I think the graphic, you, we got it on the app. If you don't have a Bible or you don't know how to do the uh, U version on your phone, we got it on the app and in, in the sermon notes of this message. You may have some conversations that actually your kids help you grow. You got a spouse, read it. If you're alone, read it alone. God cares about you, not just everybody in your life. And if you're lonely, call a friend. Read James chapter 2 because this chapter will show you. James is talking about what solid faith looks like when what you believe, what you believe begins to be what you practice. Read it. I challenge you. It's on you from here. It's on you from there, excuse me. But we're going to jump into James chapter 2 because I want to cover what I can today so that you can walk out of here and have something to see that you can apply to your life so that we just won't have flaky faith, but we will have solid faith. Y'all ready for that? Look at somebody and say, I'm ready. ready. James chapter 2, I'm going to skip around. 
The verses will be at the end. I'm going to cover verse 8 through 10, 13, and then 18 through 22 because I, I know some people came today with a Bible, and that's awesome, man. Don't take my word for it by all means. Here we go. We're going to skip around. You'll see context when you get home and actually want to grow beyond Sundays. Yes, indeed, James says, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. What's the royal law? He says it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said that's a good thing. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. Man, you're going to see some examples of that in James 2 tonight, this evening. But if you, but if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. Here we go. For, a, for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who, breaked, who has broken all of God's laws. Woo. Mm. Talk about level ground. There will be no mercy. Here's one. Ouch. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. Woo. No mercy for those who have a lot of faith in Jesus but don't show it. But if, you have, you, but, but if you've been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. I'm going to stop right there and then I'll pick back up in a minute. I know that we're all passionate about certain issues and in this season our passion is magnified which is why our hostility towards people who believe differently is magnified. What, here's, the, here's the heart behind that. James is saying, hey, whether you have one flaw or a thousand flaws, you still got issues. Look at somebody and in your pop voice say, I got issues. <laughs> Let me tell you, James is here saying whether you have one issue or a thousand, you need to realize you got issues. Whether you got different issues or less issues, the point is... You got issues. And you need to keep that in mind if you practice the type of faith that we say we believe. You need to keep that in mind when, in the way you treat people and talk to people and post to the random people that see your social media. Oh, we all got issues. You may even have less issues. We're going to see that in a minute. The point is you got issues. And when you have that heart towards people, you know they may have more issues. You may not like their issues. You may have different issues that you don't care as much about, but you got issues. That's the heart of a... Here we go. James keeps on because it gets even better. James says... I'm, I'm skipping a verse, a few verses. James says... Um, now someone may say, because a lot of people were talking about, I have faith. I have faith. James says this, now someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can, you, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? Practice. How can you show me that you believe something beautiful if you don't do anything with it? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Oh, my goodness, right here. James, in that church, we know in history and in the context of what you're going to read this evening, that this church was the type of people that they said, oh, I'm going to show you what I believe, man. I'm going to come to church. I'm gonna, it's going to be beautiful. And James says, hey, I'll tell you all what. you all show me your faith by how much you know. You go ahead and be experts. That's fine. How I'm going to show you my faith and how beautiful it is is what I do with it. And how I practice it. Because James understood one of the most valuable principles that we need to practice in 2020. He understood that there is no depth in flaky faith. And it won't do much for you or anybody else. Boy, he said, I mean, he said it very clearly. He says, I'll show y'all my faith by not how good I can quote scripture. Or how good I can talk about it or preach a good message. I'll show you by what I do with it. Faith is not what you believe, just what you believe. It's how you practice it. Here we go. He goes even further because I know, I know there were people just like today that were stubborn back then. James says, you say, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God good for you. Mm. Oh, you, yeah, boy, you love Jesus and you tell everybody about it. He says, good for you. You want a cookie? I'm telling you, I had to, I had to tell myself that about a decade ago. You want a cookie? You say you believe. He says, you got faith. You believe the right things. Okay, good for you, he continues. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see the, that faith without good deeds? Practice is useless. You know the difference of the demons? Is they got all the faith in the world. They know the heart of God. They know exactly who God is. They don't do anything with it. They got the first 50%. They, got, they know who he is. 
Well, they know all about him. The difference is what they do with it. We are walking around with the type of faith that we can believe all the right things, but we don't do anything with it. Flaky faith. Not functional faith. Dysfunctional faith. So the last verse that I'm going to cover today, and I want you to read all in between, because you're going to see that I'm not taking this out of context, is that James wants to leave them with an example of a person in their past that practiced the type of faith that they said they believed. And it was Abraham. He says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions, not by what he believed when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith, what's that say? Complete. Complete. Abraham, James was saying the reason we're talking about Abraham still, the reason they, we call him the father of our faith, Paul says it in Romans, is because Abraham didn't just say he believed God. When God told him, hey, I want you to go to a mountain and sacrifice the promise that you waited a century for. Most of us won't even live to a century. And he waited a century for it. And when Abraham said it, I'm sure he didn't like it. I'm sure he was brokenhearted. But he went to a mountain thinking that God wanted him to sacrifice his son that he was promised and waited a century for. And he was going to do it. But he found out that God didn't want Isaac's life. He wanted Abraham's heart. And when he found this out... God knew, God already knew it. He knew he could trust Abraham, but biggest, he knew Abraham trusted God. James is saying, you want to see somebody who believed it and practiced it, church? Look at Abraham. His faith didn't just sound pretty. Man, we read that story. Could you imagine taking your oldest child or your only child to a mountain and it didn't make sense? Abraham trusted God. We say we trust God now. We can have all the smoke and lights and we can get up here, we say it. But do we trust God? We say we're hopeful, but are we hopeful? Man, it's election time. So like this year, and it'll happen several months after, I hear this verse tossed around all day. And I love it. I believe it. It says this, and everybody quotes it. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. Oh, every four years, I've lived long enough now, several, in adulthood, several elections. Every four years, I only see the Christians whose person wins the election post in that verse. And they usually do it to, uh, to basically, in a passive-aggressive, righteous way, piss everybody off. You want to have solid faith? Win! Not, I'm talking about it may not happen in November, but when your person that does not win the elections, are you going to be living, breathing, and posting on social media that verse? Or are you just going to do it when your person wins? Because you don't believe the verse if you're not willing to believe it just as passionately when the person that you don't like wins the election. You're just saying it. And you're just saying it because you're in a place where, hey, they won. I, I, our country's good because they got who I wanted. I want to see a church that will post that when your person loses. Man, we say that God is faithful. We tell our kids, man, we tell them God is faithful. We tell them we preach it good to them. Man, pre we preach those stories. David not even being invited to the party that he killed the giant in. But if we look at our lives, our lives are unsteady and unstable because truly we are insecure and we're skeptical of everything and everybody, especially right now. It's just good preaching, y'all. We just tell them this is what we want you to believe, but we don't even practice it. And we wonder why our kids grow up and call BS on us. I told you I had to do this today, right? Y'all know I love you. I don't, I don't preach hard just to preach hard. It's for a purpose. Man, we say we got, I hear it all the time, we say we got the blessed hope. And we love to quote verses, especially at funerals, like, um, we sorrow not as those with no hope. But on the other side of their mouth, give them about 10 minutes, and they'll talk about how the world's going to hell, the church is going to hell, everybody sucks, the world's falling apart, it's evil, communism, fascism, whatever your side is, is taking over the entire country. That's, does that sound like hope? That doesn't sound hopeful. That sounds the opposite of hopeful. If fill in the blank gets in office, 
it's the end of our country as we know it. Last time I checked, what we say we believe is Jesus is on the throne. But our lives and what we practice tells a different story. And James is getting to the place where he's saying, guys, it's not good enough just to believe it. It's good. you got to practice it if you want to make a difference. Man, uh, the Bible says this, Paul, I mean, Paul lost his head for saying stuff like this. He said, our God always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Look, somebody say always. You want to know what always means? It means whether you get the promotion or not, always God causes us to triumph. Young people, it means whether you're, you're starting or you're on the sidelines, always our God causes us to triumph. Whether the cancer stays or goes, our God always causes us to triumph. Whether you don't like it, whether you live or die today or tomorrow, God says what he promised is what he promised. And you trust it when you have solid faith. You trust it when it's not how you planned it, when it's not how you want it, when it's not how you like it, when you die or going to die if you die sooner than you want to. Do you trust him or don't you? Always. 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 And we can say it, but our lives don't reflect it. Not today. Not mine. I'm preaching to me. Not mine. Always. And, and here's a solid faith is not denying what you're dealing with. I want you to know that straight up. We have this, we have this movement, and it's been around for years, that what's called the name and claim it. And the, 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 there's, there's healthiness in it, but there's also abuses. Because I see in the Bible tons of people that don't deny that life's sucking for them. You want to talk to me after church, I can tell you several of them right off the top of my head. Solid faith. You can say life sucks. I'm sick. I'm stressed. I don't like how things are going. I'm pissed off. You don't have to deny it, but solid faith, trust God anyway. Flaky faith is when you project on other people, on your family, on everybody that's easy to project when you're stressed. Flaky faith is when you project your frustration, your fatigue, your insecurities, your opinions, and your perspectives, and the things that you're passionate about. I'm not telling you they're wrong. I'm telling you that flaky faith is when you put that on other people and force it instead of saying, God, I don't like what I'm looking at, and I'm not okay with it, but I still trust you. And I'm going to treat people accordingly to what you said and how you lived. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Love others as I have loved you. And by this, by this, practice. By this, they will know you're my followers. By this, not by how much you know, by how much you love. Laws and legislation do not change your responsibility at all to love and treat people kindly and respectfully. Who is in office or not in office? I'll vote my conscience whether they win or lose. Who is in office does not change my responsibility to love and treat people with the respect of being a human, if we believe what we say, image bearer of God. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. The point is, are you going to preach it or practice it? Because faith isn't just what you believe, it's how you practice it. I know that this has been an issue for a lot of people. What's political and what's people. I'm going to tell you, there's pretty much all the issues we're dealing with in this country are people issues. Democrats and Republicans are not the problem in this world. I'm going to put this out there. Media is not the problem. Those, those they, they play into the problem. They feed the problem, no doubt. The problem is not uh, uh, political parties. The problem is not the media. They just play into the problems because we give them access to work. I'm going to kind of start winding this thing down by asking you this. Do you want to know the one contribution that every one of us can make in this world that has the capacity to change it? You want to know it? Do you want to know it? Because it's really simple. It's just not easy. My second son, Jacob, you know, he graduated from tech, and he, since May, he's been an engineer in Augusta. He comes home about once a month. He comes home about once a month, and um, I love my time with him, my pop son time. He's one of those that comes and goes. He's a runner, and, um, and um, 
Jacob, we just got some time one Saturday morning, the last time he was here. We sat at the table, and I began to tell him, you know, how stressful this season was, not just because of COVID, because honestly, it, praying and seeking God, Derek and I realize it's time for us to hit these people issues in the face and make better humans, whether people don't like it or not, whether they like it or not. And I told Jacob, I said, right now, man, it is, it is hard because I knew it was coming, but I still wasn't ready for it. And Jacob told me, he's like, Pops, he's like, I'm just going to tell you, um, you can't preach things that people need to hear right now without being called political, but I believe you, it's not political. And so we sat down and Jacob said, I was talking to a friend in Augusta and he said, you know the one thing, everybody's confused, every, every different political party and ideology basically has their idea of what we need to do to fix everything, to create unity and equality in the, in the country. And he said, but you know the one thing that we can all, I was so proud, the one thing he still has the heart even in Augusta. He said, the one thing that we could all give that would make the world better more than any po political law or anything, you know what it is? I said, what, Jake? He said, empathy. I was floored in that moment. I, I had to fight back tears because I didn't want him to come home and me be sappy because he hates that. Empathy. He, Jacob said, it's free. Oh, it's, it, it's not cheap, but it's free. To acknowledge other people's feelings and their pain and their perspective and their opinions, that is free. I'm going back to the verse James says, if you want mercy from God, what do he say? Give it to people. I'm still on top. I'm still on top of the verse. Empathy. You can acknowledge people's feelings and perspectives and opinions even when you don't agree with them or how they're acting about them. But you do not have to attack. I'm talking to me right now because I got some things that frustrate me. I got, man, people I agree with, I'm getting sick and tired of hearing them. Amen. Man, you, you can have empathy. You can acknowledge it is wrong and it is not practice. It is not practicing the love of Jesus to attack and disregard. You don't have to agree with your brother, but you don't need to disregard him. Their feelings matter because when people feel like everything they have to say gets pushed back, what do people begin to believe? They don't matter. Your feelings and your opinions matter. We're open to them. They matter. But when we constantly, people don't think they matter. So what does this look like? Listen to me, empathy. When you acknowledge other people's feelings, even when you don't agree with them, you don't attack them. You ready? COVID-19 slash 20. Whether you think it's serious or not, whether you think it's a governmental ploy to take over the world or not, empathy is acknowledging the fact that you got people in your world, that, in, your, in your life that don't believe that way. I'm going to tell you in a minute, we got somebody in Catapam that's fighting for their life right now because of it. You know how bad it would make them feel to hear some of you put your opinions out there that your opinion matters but they're in a position that right now numbers and statistics don't matter when you have somebody you love facing and becoming one of them. Empathy. This world needs it, man. This country needs it. Our churches don't even practice it. We just talk about it. Empathy. Man, your brothers and sisters of a different color than you, empathy. You don't have to agree with their opinion and their perspective, but you have to be willing enough to say, I love Jesus enough to know that my reference isn't the only reference. Because you don't deal with the things they deal with and they don't deal with the things you deal with. Empathy! Empathy. 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 Being open. That's what Jesus did. If you don't believe it, you need to read your Bible in context and not just quote KJV. Empathy. So I'm going to just put it out there. This is where Catalyst stands because I'm tired of people wondering. And if you want to talk more about it, I'll sit down with you. But if you've been in this church long enough that you know me and Derek, you know we're approachable. So it's on you if you don't come talk through some things. And if you don't like what we have to say, we want you to be happy. But this is where the church is going. Straight up. You ready? One line, there's room for you. There's room for you. I have never seen a church more diverse in context than ours. I know there's not one in this county, no doubt. There's room for you, Republicans and Democrats. There's room for you. 
We acknowledge your opinion. We acknowledge your position and we are not afraid to challenge it when it challenges the love of Jesus and how it looks in people's lives. We will challenge you. My brothers and sisters of different races than me, I know that I'm a nerdy white boy that as Chris Brown says, preaches like a black guy. Oh, as the, as the hip hop song says, here's how, we, here's how we roll. Black, white, Puerto Rican, or Haitian, it's all the same in the hip hop nation. And if you don't know that song, I'm sorry that you grew up in an inferior generation of rap music. Man, there's room for you here. Man, here's one. It's going to be hard for some of you to hear because you haven't got here yet. Your sexual orientation, there's room for you. You like boys, girls, or both, there's room for you here. I know some people, I may have just lost you. There's room for you here. There's room for you here. If you didn't know it, there is. There's room for you here. All we want to do is show you how much Jesus loves you and let him work in you and you see what that looks like in your life. We will challenge anybody that stands in the way of the way Jesus treated people because his love will change anybody. You don't have to tell them how to change. His love will. There's room for you here, man. All my rigid people right now that you you know a lot about the Bible or you're a beginner and you're really like, you're like radical, man. You use religion as a drug or, or you're just passionate, man. Man, you're sincere. I was there in Bible college. Man, I was sincere. I was just wrong. There's room for you here. You may be miserable here because we're not going to be afraid to challenge you. But if you're open and if you're miserable, man, we want you to be happy somewhere where you can be. But we're not going to stop doing what we do even when people stop. We haven't changed. We're the same church we always were and we're always going to be that way. There's room for you. There is room for you. Jesus, the reason this movement started is the, the commandment he gave us. He didn't just preach, he practiced. Man, he practiced. Jesus said, and Jesus stands and James teaches and Jesus teaches and the trajectory of the entire New Testament begs the question, do you trust him? Do you trust him? Because if you do trust him, then you trust in him enough to treat people like they're human beings. And it doesn't matter if you don't like what they believe. You don't have to like it. You don't have to understand it to love them like Jesus loves them. Do you trust him enough to treat people like they are just as much human beings and children of God as you? And two, do you trust him that when things don't make sense in your life, that you're still not, you're going to be solid. You're going to say, God, I trust you. Because James left James chapter 2. He says, remember Abraham, guys, because the reason we're still talking about him several thousand years later is because that man didn't just say he believed it. He poured his life and sold out into it. My question, Catalyst, is that you? Is that you? Is that you? We're not perfect, but I'm not going to apologize for trying my best that when I die one day, I'm going to die saying, Jesus, I poured my all into doing it the best I knew how the way you did it. Do you want it? Do you want it? Will you bow your head with me? Lord, I, as best I know how to do, I pour my heart out because I love, I love everybody here. I love everybody here. I love the people that I haven't even met yet that are visiting. I love them. And Lord, I want them to know how much you love them. And I want them not to just be able to talk about it and to be inspired by it. I want them to be able to live that out every single day when people don't return that love. They still give it away freely because they know what you said and they are solid, not flaky in it. Right now, Jesus, we want you. Will you just lift your hands if that's you? You don't even have to agree with anything I just said. Will you just lift your hands and say, God, I want you? More than a song. I don't want to just sing to you. I want to live for you. Right now, if that's you, just, just say it in your heart. Say, I want you, Jesus. And we want it. In Jesus' name. Amen.